Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson Part 1 The Old Buck and Near 1. The Old Sea Dog at the Admiral Benbow Squire Tony, Dr. Lindsay, say, and the rest of the gentlemen having asked me to write down the whole particulars of the treasure island from beginning to end, keeping nothing back but the bearings of the island, and that only be, that only because there is still treasure not yet lifted. I take my pen in the year of grace, 17, and go back to the time when my father kept the Admiral Bow, Ben Bowl in. The brown old seaman with a sabre cut first took up his lodgings under our roof. I remember him as if it were yesterday. He came plodding to the inn door, his sea chest following behind him in a hand barrel. A tall, strong, heavy, nut brown man, his tawny pigtail falling over the shoulder of his soiled blue coat, his hands ragged and scarred, with black broken nails a sabre cut across one cheek, a dirty, livid white. I remember him looking round the cove and whistling to myself as I did so, then breaking out the old sea song he sang so often afterwards, Fifteen men on a dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho, ho, and a bottle of rum. A high old tottering voice, the sea that in tune had broken the captain at bars, when he rapped on the door with a bit of a stick, like a hand spike he carried when my father appeared called roughly for a glass of rum this when it was brought to him he drank slowly like a connoisseur lingering on the taste and still looking about him at the cliffs up at our signboard this is an andy cove said he says he at the length a peasant sit shop manage company mate my father took pity in him very little company more it was a pity. Well then, said he, this is the borough for me. Hey, you are me, cried to the man who tongued the barrow, bringing my up alongside and help up my chest. I stay here a bit, continued I, with a plain man, rum and bacon and eggs, but I want head up there, up for a, for her to watch ships off. You watch your mother call me, you might want to call me captain. Oh, I see what you are at there. Go down three or four gold pieces on the threshold. I can tell, you can tell me when I work through that, says he, looking a fierce of commander. Indeed, bad as his clothes were, of course, as he spoke, he had none of the appearance of a man who sailed before the mast. And it seemed like a mate or skipper accustomed to be ordered or to be obeyed or to strike. Man who came down with the baron told us the mail had set him down a morning before the royal George inquired about inquired what inns were were along the coast hearing hours well spoken of, I suppose, as well as as lonely and chosen it from the others of his place of residence. That was all we could learn, could learn of our guest. He was a very silent man by custom. All day he hung around the cove upon the cliffs with a brass telescope, oiling sat in the corner of the pile next to the fire, drank rum and water very strong. Mostly he would not speak when spoken to him, only look up sudden, fierce, and blow through his nose like a foghorn. We and the people came about our house, look, soon learned to turn, but let him be. Every day he would come back from his stroll. He would ask if any seafaring man had gone by along the road. At first we thought it was would want a company of his own kind. I made him ask, I made him ask this question. At last we began to see he was delirious to avoid them. When a seaman put up put up at the Admiral Bowman bow, as now and then did make him by the coach road for Bristol, he would look at him through the curtain door before he entered the parlour. He was always sure to be silent as a mouse when any such were present. 
For me, at least, there was no secret about his manner. Matter, as I was, in a way, his share of his alarms. He had taken me aside one day and promised me silver for money, the first of every month, for to keep my wearer eye open, a sea for every man one leg. They didn't know the moment he appeared. Quite often, when the first of the month came in, I applied to him for my wage. He would only blow through his nose at me and stare down, but before the week was out, he was sure to think better of it. Bring me my four penny piece. I repeat his orders to look out for a sea very man with one leg. Now the part of that personage haunted my dreams and need scarcely tell you. On stormy nights when the wind shook the four corners of the house, surf rolled, roared up along the cove and up the cliffs, I would see him in thousand forms and with a thousand diabolical expressions. Now the leg would be cut off at the knee, now at the hip, now he's a monstrous kind of creature who never had but one the lone leg in the middle of his body. To see him leap and run and pursue me over the hedge and ditch was the worst of nightmares. And altogether I paid pretty dear for my monthly four penny piece. The shape of those abominable fancies. But though I was terrified of by the idea of seafaring man with one leg, as far less afraid of the captain himself and anyone else who knew him. And nights when he took a deal more run and water, and water than his head would carry, he would sometimes sit and sing his wicked old wild sea songs, minding nobody, but sometimes he'd call for glasses around. And folks of the trembling company would listen to his stories of bear chorus his singing, often heard the house shaking with a yo ho ho and a bar around. All the neighbours joined in for the dear life, with a fear of death upon them, each singing louder than the other to avoid a remark. For in these fits he was the worst overriding companion ever known. He would slap his hand on a table for sights all round. He would fly up in passion of anger, a question sometimes was none would put. He'd be, he said be judged the company was not following his story. Nor would he allow anyone to leave the inn to be drunk and still sleeping and reeled off to bed. His stories are what frightened people most, of all dreadful stories. They were about hanging, walking the plank and storms at sea, the dry tudruguras of wild deeds and places Spanish main. His own account, he must have lived his life among some of the wickedest men. The guard of allowed upon the sea, the language in which he told these stories, shocked up plain country people almost as much as the crimes that he described. Her father was always saying that in would be ruined for people who soon cease coming. They had to be trainerized, over and put down, and went sent shivering to the beds. But I really believe his presence did us good. People were frightened at the time, but looking back, they rather liked it. It was a free and fine excitement, a quiet country life. There was even a party of young men, younger men who pretended to admire him, calling him a true sea dog, a real old salt, as if it was such like names. A saying that it was as a sort of man made England terrible at sea. In one way, indeed, he bade fair to ruin us, for he kept on saying week after week, at least month after month, that all in money had been long exhausted. So my father never plucked up the courage to assist, having more. He never hit. If he ever mentioned it, Captain Blue threw his nose so loudly he might say he roared and stare my poor father out the room. Been, I've seen him wringing his hands after such a blue buff. I'm sure the nights that Terry lived in must have greatly hastened his early happy death. At the time he lived with us, the captain made no change whatever in his dress but to buy some stockings from a hawker. One of the cocks of his hat, having fallen down, it let, let it hang. From that day forth, though, it was a great annoyance when he blew. I remember the appearance of his coat, but he patched himself up stairs in his room, which was before the end, with nothing but patches. He never wrote to receive a letter. He never spoke of any but the neighbours, of these for the most part, only when drunk or rum. A great sea chest none of us had ever opened, ever seen open. He only once 
crossed, and that was towards the end. When my poor father was far gone, I declined, and I took him off. Dr. Lipsy came one of, late afternoon to see the patient, took a bit of a dinner for my mother, and sent into the parlour, a parlour to smoke a pipe till his horse could come down from the hamlet, for he had not to slow stealing at old Ben Bow. I followed him in, in a member, served a conscious and neat bright doctor, with his powder as white as snow, his bright black eyes and pleasant manners, made a cottage country folk, and above all, the filthy, heavy, bearded square girl of a part of ours, sitting far gone, a rum, with his arms on a table. Suddenly the, he, the captain, that has began to pipe up his eternal song, Fifteen men in a dead man's chest, Yo ho ho, the bottle rum. Drink the devil had done for the rest. Yo ho ho, had a bottle rum rum. First, I suppose the dead man chest to be that identical big box of his of his upstairs in that front room. The front room, I thought it'd been mingled ming, mingled in my nightmares with that one legged seafaring man. But by this time, we had all long ceased to pay any particular notice of the song. It was new and that night to no one but Dr. Lin- Lindsay, and in him, I observed, I did not produce an agreeable effect. He looked up for a, for a moment, quite angrily, before he went on with his talk on the old tailor Gardner, no new curve for the rheum- rheumatics. In the meantime, the captain gradually brightened up his own music, and at last flapped his hand upon the table, or him in a way we all knew to mean silence. Voices stopped at once, all but Dr. Lindsay's. Lindsay's. He went on before speaking clear and more kind, and joined briskly with his pipe between every word or two. Captain glared at him, a while flapped his head down again, hand again, glared still harder, and at last broke out with a vinous low oath. Silence there between decks. Were you addressing me, sir? says the doctor, when the ruffian had told him, with the other oath that it was so. I have only one thing to say to you, sir, cries the doctor. If you keep on your drinking rum, the world will soon be, soon be quit of a very drunk, dirty scoundrel. The old man's fear was awful. He sprang to his feet, drew and opened a sailor's carved knife, and balancing open on palm his hand, threatened to pin the doctor to the wall. The old fellow's fury was awful. Bang so his feet drew and opened a sailor's calf knife. Bang it up, open on a palmy's hand, threatened to pin the doctor to the wall. The doctor had never much as moved. He spoke to him, and before, over his shoulder, the same tone of voice, rather high, so the room could hear, but perfectly calm and steady. If you do not put that knife this instant in your pocket, I promise upon my honour you will hang at the next exercises. Then followed a battle of looks between them, but the captain soon knuckled under, put up his weapon, and resumed his seat, grumbling like a baited dog. And now, sir, continued the doctor, since I now know there's such a fellow in my district, you may count I have an eye upon you day and night. I'm not a doctor only, I'm a magistrate, though I catch a breath of complaint against you, if it's only piece of incivility like tonight's. I take the effectual means to have you wanted down. And routed out of this, let that suffice. He went after Dr. Lindy's horse, came to the door, and he rode away, but the captain held his peace, and that evening, and for many evenings to come.